Thank you. Good morning and welcome to CSIS. Uh, today's event is one that actually uh, is one that we liked, right, uh, in terms of projects that like to the point where people were fighting over who would get to do it, which doesn't always happen. It's on government policies for open source software. Uh, we've done this in the past. <clears throat> it's a very different environment, in part because uh, code has become one of the crucial products for the digital economy. And so one of my other projects is counting how many coders we actually have, how do you teach coders. Um, the software environment is completely different than it was 20 years ago. Uh, the open source software contribution to that environment is very different. The issues are different too. Uh, there, it's a lot less ideological than the last time we did this. And that's actually a plus, right? So you don't have these intense disputes that we're, it would be a very tense meeting when we did it in the past. Um, this study, and we have the author here, Eugenio Lostri, this study basically continues something we do a lot at CSS, which is we just use open source information uh, to count and then to categorize. And the intent is to provide a resource for people to look at different kinds of open source software, how it's used, where it came from. Um, it's been uh, pretty useful, it's been interesting. Uh, we were a little surprised at how much we found. Uh, so that's been great. What I'm gonna do is I'm going to introduce the sp today's speaker and the panelists. I'm just going to give their titles, their bios are on our website somewhere. Uh, naturally, their bios are too long to read, that would take the whole event. We will have keynote remarks from Alan Friedman, Senior Advisor and Strategist at the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Agency, followed by a panel with Shelley McKinley, Chief Legal Officer for GitHub, Laura Cunningham, President of the Open Tech Fund, uh, Eugenio Lostri, who has defected from CSIS and is now a lawfare uh, and was the principal author of the report, and then online will be Frank Nagel, who most of you probably know, uh, who's at the Harvard Business School. And we'll do this in a way where Alan will speak. We'll then ask the panelists to make opening remarks. At some point, um, we will take questions from the audience. And I think are we, we, it's either a card. If you're in the online audience, I think there's a button that you can push to submit a question. And those are usually fun. So we look forward to your questions. Uh, we look forward to Alan's remarks. Alan, thank you. Uh, thank you, Jim. Uh, great to be back at CSIS. Uh, so we're here to talk about open source, and of course, because I am from the cybersecurity agency, I'm gonna be focusing on some security side of things, but of course, it's much bigger than that. Uh, Jim pointed out that, right, we used to have a battle about uh, you know open source versus proprietary code, and of course, that's no longer a battle, right? Those they're they've become both synonymous, and open source is a critical part of the of, of the ecosystem that we have today. And of course, this panel knows a lot more about that whole picture than I do. Um, there is fascinating diversity in this, right? One of the core challenges when we talk about open source and start thinking about solutions, uh, to say there's no one size fits all is a very, very uh, enormous exaggeration. We have massively used projects uh, that underscore the entire global software world and the global technical world. Indeed, all businesses depend on some things like this. And, but the vast majority are perhaps tiny projects that are very important to a very small group of people. Some of them have massive amounts of support with time, attention, resources, and others, perhaps more, are just hey, I wrote a thing, let me throw it out there and see if anyone cares. Uh, and often the answer is no, and occasionally the answer is, dear God, yes, we need this. Uh, and so balancing that is always tricky whenever you're building a solution. But of course, we've started to pay attention to something that is not a new issue, uh, which is, hey, is the stuff we're using actually secure? And even defining that is tricky. So hey, is this new pull request, does it count as a security update that I need to track? Or is it just a random update? Uh, if we don't have some of the traditional tools that we use in security, giving it a common vulnerability enumeration number, a CVE, then it's tricky 
to actually integrate into how we traditionally think about security. But beyond security, we have sort of these joint ideas of resiliency and sustainability. And there are a couple of stories that I want to put on the table as we think about our, our projects. So many of you have heard of LeftPad. LeftPad was a very small function. It was one of the easiest things. Almost anyone, Jim could easily write this function. Uh, it basically took a uh, array and filled in the zeros to the left from a given point. The author disagreed with some management decisions that were made by the NPM package and said, I'm going to take this and go home. Completely within their rights. Uh, but this was used by other things that were used by other things that it turns out were a critical part of the global web platform known as Node. And when it was yanked, it broke a giant chunk of the web for a couple of days in 2016. More recently, the people who run the Python package, uh, right, PyPy, said, hey, everyone's now focused on security. Let's give our developers two-factor tokens. This is a priority for CISA, is to say, hey, we should all be shifting from just having a password to having two factors. And so they said, hey, we want to send you a free token so that when you log in for your packages, and they looked at the top 1% of PyPy packages, uh, and which is still a large number, they said, um, we'd like you to use this. And some people said, great. But a huge percentage of leading Python maintainers said, nope, we don't care. That's not our problem. Pound sand. And there's one more thing that I, I want to sort of share that came up uh, this is over the holiday weekend, over the New Year's holiday weekend. A, a French developer wrote a blog post. His name is Thomas de Pierre. And he wrote a blog post that said, I am not a supplier. And forgive me for, for reading, um, but I, I want to share this, which is, if you use this, my software, I owe you nothing at all. We have no relationship. I put this up online as a condition that if you use it, all risks are on you. What it means is there is no supply chain here. Now, in large companies, we've been thinking about supply chains. And of course, in the US government, we're now focused on where does the stuff we use come from? Because we need to understand the risks. But it's important to remember that for a large portion of the ecosystem that we care about, that perspective is not shared. And so as we build out policies, we need to focus on that. So what are the solutions? That's what the panel is going to be talking about. But I do want to flag a couple of things. One, uh, visibility is first and foremost the absolute necessary piece. And I don't just say that because SIS has been working on SBOM for a while. Uh, software Bill of Materials is an absolutely vital piece that everyone should have. It's still strange to me that we don't think about what's in our software, especially our proprietary software, so that we all have visibility, both the people who make the software and the people who use the software. There are third-party services that can help with this to say not only once you ha know what you have, let's do some metrics. And of course, the Open Source Software Foundation has been thinking about what these metrics can be. And there are companies out there that can give you more detail, more insight, and indeed even help you with the security side of things. The US government is still in the process of organizing and coordinating our strategy. Uh, a lot of that work is being led by the Office of the National Cyber Director, pulling together experts from everything from CISA and NIST to the FTC. Right? So we're trying to make sure we have a big tent. Uh, some of the great work that's happened is in tracking uh, visibility across the US government and promoting specialized but very important advances such as memory safety. And CIS is, of course, working on our own strategy, figuring out how do we partner with the leading large companies, but also acknowledging that that's not the entire open source world. Uh, the open source world is full of global efforts. Uh, our friends in Europe don't always align with, you know, maybe the big tech side of things, and that's okay. I'm trying to build strategies that work on that. And the last thing I'll say is, as we learn more about the security of this domain, it's important to acknowledge that we should expect it to get worse before it gets better. 
uh, or rather greater visibility into different types of risks means that we're going to see more risks. That doesn't mean the problem is getting worse. That means that we are in a better position to understand what the risks are and how we collectively can deal with them. I'm really excited to hear the panel. I know you're not gonna be focusing just on security, but that is one of our national priorities. Thanks. Alan, do you want to sit up here? Alan. Go ahead. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Well, I, I, we didn't give Alan enough credit because how long have you been doing SBOM? A long time. About five years now. Since. Five years, yeah. And many of us would have bet against it ever coming to fruition at the start. So if nothing else, you deserve an award for your tenacity. Uh, it's gone quite well. And of course, security is one of the issues. I think when ONCD releases their new strategy, you'll see uh, open source, the provenance of software, SBOM, all highlighted along with a number of other things. But let me now turn to the panel uh, and get their views on this subject, then we'll open it up for discussion. Um, Shelley, can I start with you? Sure, you can start with me. Great. Um, I didn't know I was starting, but I'm happy to. Well, we can switch. <laughs> I'm kidding, no, it's fine. Um, I, it's really, I'm yeah. really delighted to Personal be here view. today. Um, as you mentioned, I'm the Chief Legal Officer of GitHub, and um, I, you know, just to offer a couple, of, really, to, really to kind of resonate what you said, um, Alan, the, um, Things have changed in the last 10 or 20 years, and it's exciting to see how things have moved from really procurement by uh, proprietary software versus uh, use open source for budgetary decisions to really thinking about what open source can do in terms of modernization, uh, in terms of uh, capacity building, uh, and all of the opportunity we have through the global collaboration of developers and GitHub as uh, the home for over 94 million developers and the stewards of really the world's kind of public code bases has a unique role, uh, a unique opportunity and a unique responsibility to be involved in the policy discussions. And so that's why as a company we put a focus on policy and, and on things like obviously like cybersecurity. Um, and how we engage in the global cybersecurity policy discussions and, and part of the solutions. So just to sort of open it up and just uh, offer a couple of comments about the way um, that we engage, I wanted to focus on a couple of things. One is uh, you know, the economic impact and how GitHub can be um, a source for uh, economic data about open source. And we think about um, the study that you'll talk about in a little bit. And um, you know, some of that uh, data, I believe, came from, from GitHub. Um, but for us, it's important to, um, to ensure that we empower um, others with data about, um, about the economic impact of open source. Because traditionally, of course, innovation and software innovation was measured in software pat patents granted. And that obviously doesn't work for open source in the same way it works for proprietary software. And it doesn't work for proprietary software anymore the same way it used to because, uh, as you mentioned, there is so much open source in everything. I think the latest studies talk about between 97 and 99 percent of the world's software has open source components in it. Um, and so, you know, we're very focused on, on how do we help demonstrate economic impact. I know um, a, great, a, a great paper that Frank, who I'm looking at you back, you're, at the, you're very large in the back of the room, um, put out in, in 2021 um, talking about the um, GitHub commits and local economic innovation in the entrepreneurship area. And so being able to help provide data and information to help measure that was, was a key piece of something that, that we could contribute. And there are many, many other ways um, that we work on economic impact, um, including uh, the World Intellectual Property Institute also recently in the 2022 uh, innovation study uh, used GitHub commit data as an indicator of uh, economic and creative output. Um, so there are a lot of ways that we like to be able to engage in the policy debate using really the data that comes off of GitHub as the home of 94 million developers today and growing. Um, the second area I just wanted to flag is the, the topic of collaboration and how GitHub collaborates with others. Being an open source company, we take, a, we take a page from the open source book and collaboration is key. And something you mentioned is obviously the security collaboration work that we're doing. Um, and the opportunity that we have at GitHub as part of, part of being a solution to the challenge. 
um, which many things that we can do to help educate open source developers, uh, to help use automated tools um, that help people write more secure code from the very beginning, um, as well as ensure that we are engaging in a way that represents the interests and advocating for the interests of the developers on our platform. Um, so we're excited to be able to engage in those kinds of opportunities. Um, and then um, another piece that you also briefly touched on is just diversity. Um, diversity in all things open source is important. Um, like the technology industry, the open source industry is not as diverse as we want it to be. It doesn't have as many women, it doesn't have as many um, underrepresented minorities, it doesn't have as many people from the global south as the global north. Um, and so one thing that GitHub does focus on is to help uh, through our own programmatic efforts, something that we call all in, working at GitHub and then working with others, Linux Foundation and other companies um, to help build the pipeline of diverse developers. Uh, and as a final thought, as we get started here, I would say one of the most important things that we do um, as well is to um, ensure that around the world GitHub is open for developer collaboration. Um, I, if people have been following what's been going on in Iran, uh, for example, GitHub is available there, and we're very proud of having worked with OFAC a couple of years ago uh, to make GitHub available in Iran before we, even the latest general license was issued. Um, and we'll continue to do that work to push to ensure that around the world where open source really is a place that people can be free to discuss uh, ideas and exchange ideas and collaborate, uh, that GitHub's available everywhere developers are. So thanks so much for having me on the panel, and I'll pass Thank it on you. with those comments. Thank you. Yeah, the, the um, trying to track who's involved now. At some point, maybe 25 years ago, you could feel it. You had a sense of who was in the community, and you def I definitely don't have that now. So it's blossomed in a great way. Um, Laura, uh, if you would, uh, and I should note that let us welcome uh, Professor Frank Nagel, Harvard Business School, thank you for joining us remotely. We're glad you're here. But Laura, please, over to you. Thank you so much. So thanks for having me today. Um, and as Jim said earlier, I'm the president of the Open Technology Fund. Um, I thought I'd start by talking a little bit about OTF because we are not GitHub or CSIS, and we are a small NGO. Um, but OTF has been around for about a decade. Um, we are a nonprofit um, that aims to advance internet freedom globally to ensure that individuals all around the world can exercise their fundamental human rights online. Um, we do that specifically by investing in the research, the development, implementation, and maintenance of open source internet freedom technologies. So focusing specifically on anti-censorship and privacy and security enhancing tools. Um, so while you may not have heard of OTF before, um, today over two billion people around the world rely on technology that OTF has supported and about two thirds of all mobile phone users have OTF technology on their devices. Um, and I don't say that to tout OTF, um, I say that because I think it is a really great example of the importance of investing in open source technologies. Um, I don't think we would have had near the impact that OTF has had without investing in open source tools, which has really allowed our tools to build trust and to be adopted and proliferate to that user base globally. Um, so I'm gonna pivot a little bit and really talk about what open source means kind of from a civil society perspective. Um, I think a lot of times we think of it from a government and regulatory perspective or a private sector perspective. Um, but open source is so critical to civil society, uh, especially when we think about innovation and trust and security. Um, I think it's particularly important to think about that civil society aspect from non-US and non-European perspectives as well. Um, <clears throat> so I wanted to, to take a step back and, and kind of, as Jim said, talk about part of the open source community that we get to work really closely with, which is in those non-US and non-European countries. Um, and to kind of uh, put a spotlight on what that community looks like. Um, for many folks in the civil, so civil society open source community, you know, they are um, working in really non-traditional forms. So it's one or two individuals collaborating together, a group of volunteers working on something, maybe a small nonprofit organization. 
Um, so the investments that they are making are with really small but passionate teams, and that shapes a lot about what they are able to do um, and how they are able to develop and maintain their code that I think is really critical for us to keep in consideration. Um, I also wanted to talk about why, in that case, open source particularly is so important for these communities. Um, I think the first part, um, and Shelley talked about it a little bit, is with regards to innovation and community. Um, when you're thinking about civil society organizations, um, their ability to learn from each other, to be able to share information, really becomes critical to their success. And open source code allows for that innovation, it allows for that community development and sharing and multiplier effect in a way that kind of traditional software development doesn't necessarily. Um, and so it becomes really critical for, uh, for allowing civil society to engage in this space and to innovate in this space. Um, the other part of open source that is, I think, really key for civil society is with regards to security. And I will caveat that by saying that this is not a fulsome solution to security. But when you're thinking about really small organizations or individuals who are working on code, often, almost always, they don't have large security teams behind them or a budget to really kind of maintain and update their code. So providing that transparency around their code that allows others to evaluate it, uh, to contribute to it, allows for an avenue to increase security um, that otherwise wouldn't be available to a lot of civil society developers and organizations. Um, and lastly, um, I think one of the most important parts of open source code for civil society actors is transparency and trust building. Um, many of the groups that we work with around the world are um, working in repressive environments or high-risk environments doing their work, and so the technologies that are, they are adopting are really kind of critical to their own security and um, their own ability to be effective in the work that they do. So being able to uh, evaluate code themselves, being able to have the autonomy and ability to adopt things that are right for them, becomes really critical not only in their own safety and security in the technologies that they adopt, but also their ability to build trust with other individuals in their community. Um, I think OTF is actually a great example of that importance of trust and transparency. Um, I think if you went back 10 years ago and we said we're gonna create a US government funded organization that's gonna invest in internet freedom technologies that two billion people around the use world are gonna use someday, people would have laughed. Um, but the reality is from the very beginning, OTF has been insistent on investing in open source technologies and honoring that transparency. And I think we have been able to build that trust and community in large part because we have focused so much on, on open source um, investments. Um, and so I think that's a great example of how important that is for this community in particular. Um, Lastly, I want to talk about the challenges that civil society face when it comes to open source development. Um, there are you know, a lot of advantages to open source development, um, but I think as many of us are familiar with, open source community, particularly from a civil society perspective, is very under-resourced. Um, open source code is often adopted without being kind of supported in line with that adoption, um, and it creates a uh, for many civil society organizations, kind of a tragedy of the commons. Um, I also think that historically there have been a lot of assumptions made about the sustainability of open source code. Because the code is open source, somehow it is inherently sustainable in and of itself and it will live on forever. Um, I think we all know at this point that that is not the reality. However, I don't think you know, the, the technology community or even funder or donor communities have quite come up with a way to really think critically about what that sustainability needs to look like going forward. Uh, I think we know it's not working, but we haven't figured out what those solutions are. Um, and so I think 
one of the things that we need to do in particular is think about not only how do we support the technology and the code and the security, but also how do we think about supporting the communities that support these technologies? Um, what does it mean to really invest in the small groups who want to be able to maintain this code but don't have the resources and support to do so? Um, so I think the thing I really wanted to add to this discussion is as we talk about enhancing security and creating accountability and even regulatory interventions around open source code, to also talk about the need for support for open source developers. I think those have to happen hand in hand if we're going to create an open source community that is really as open and diverse um, and as empowered as we've started to talk about on this panel today. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I, the sustainability point is a crucial one. It's been around for a while, so maybe we can come back to it. Uh, let me now ask Eugenio Lostri from uh, the actual author of the report, or lead author, uh, to give some remarks. <clears throat> Thank you, Jim. Um, it's, it's great to be back at CSIS, um, and I'm actually really excited to see this project finally go live. Um, as you mentioned, I was part of the team of researchers that uh, was doing a months-long survey about um, government policies on open source software uh, around the world. And actually, I'm glad you guys went before because so many of the themes that, that you're mentioning were part of the research that we were doing. So it's, it's good to see that there's, a, there's an overlap there. Um, I, I really want to, before I get started with kind of an overview of the, of the project and how we went about it, I wanted to uh, call out and, and really thank everyone who was a part of the project. Um, this was a, really a team effort, and particularly uh, Georgia and Mega, who you know, helped shape this and, and really made it uh, the project that it is. So, so thank you both. Um, and I also want to thank the entire open source software community. They were all like very welcoming and very engaged when we were presenting this draft. And um, you know, their feedback really, really helped us. So, so thank you to everyone who participated. Um, so I thought I could provide a bit of an overview of the project. Um, something that this really solidified for me is that although there is a lot of talk about open source and security in particular, at least in the US, um, about open source software security now, this is not at all a new issue, right? We have a survey of 669 policies that go from 1999 to mid last year. Like that's a lot of policies, that's a lot of people who have been thinking about this for, for a long time. So what we did was we took those 669 policies and we analyzed them through several lenses. So if you actually go to the, the data set, which I actually encourage everyone to do, um, you'll see that it already provides kind of a comprehensive perspective of the different things that open source software policies can try to accomplish and how different countries have been thinking about this over time. So what we really wanted to understand was what are the different roles that governments can take when we're talking about supporting open source software policy? Personally, um, I think that one of the most interesting aspects of the research was going into what are the goals? So is a particular government concerned with the procurement of open source software? Are they thinking about how do you provide training on open source for your citizens or for your uh, government officials? Um, or are they thinking, you know, first steps, what is the value that open source software can, can create? We found so many of these policies that are like, we need to study this issue. Um, so that is intimately related, I think, to the reasons that governments offer for supporting a given policy. And here, Jim, I hope you don't mind. I'm going to go a bit down a rabbit hole um, and, and give a bit more detail about um, you know, recognizing the full spectrum of concerns that we saw in these policies, because I think these really relate to what are the priorities that different governments have um, in the digital realm. So in this data set, we categorize policies depending on whether they address one or more of, of the following, and here I'm going to read so I don't forget anything. Um, so first, we looked at costs. 
whether governments were looking at the procurement or you know, looking into using more of open source just because it's a cheaper alternative because they don't want to be dependent on one, uh, one provider. Um, or because they recognize that they, their government has been depending on a pirated software and they really need an alternative to that. Um, you were talking about modernization and that's really something that we saw. Um, kind of a focus over time in how can this help modernize um, our e-government services or um, can this be a way for, you know, just modernizing services across, across the board. Um, of course, security, but not just the security of open source software and thinking about um, software supply chain, but also how open source can increase the security of the government services. Sovereignty. So in many cases, we see governments thinking of, so, um, of open source software as a way to advance their own tech sovereignty and autonomy um, and maybe stopping them from being dependent on uh, third country technology. And, and, and there's many regions in which this is actually a, a top priority that is always mentioned. Um, there's also a support for national industry. In some cases, you are trying to advance, you know, closely related to sovereignty. You want to support the development of national software in your country, um, and what better way to do it. Um, and finally, we looked at transparency. We looked at how open source, in some cases, open source software is seen as a way to increase transparency on maybe how funds are used by the government and what kind of procurement is being arranged, what is going on behind it. Um, but also, open source software can increase visibility into the systems themselves. So, of course, this is not a full extent of what we covered on this project. Again, I encourage everyone to go and see it and, and use it. It is, the designers have done a beautiful work of translating a complicated Excel sheet into a interactive document, so I really encourage you to look at it. Um, but, you know, I really think, just to kind of wrap up this, that um, if open source software as a policy issue is gaining more traction and we're going to be seeing hopefully more implementation of this type of policies. Um, it is it's going to be a great resource for understanding what's been done, what has been thought about, um, and, and really use that as a way to ensure better policy making. So with that, thank you, Jim. Great, thanks, Eugenia, and welcome back, at least temporarily. Um, let me now turn to Frank, who I think most of the audience knows, and we're very grateful that you were able to make some time for us. And, we can see you very clearly here. So, uh, Frank, over to you. Great. Thanks so much, and, and thank you for having me and for uh, allowing me to be remote. It's a, a crazy time uh, here. So, thank you very much. Um, it's great to be on uh, this panel with all of the, these excellent folks, and, and I do wish I could be there in person. I've lived in DC for a decade, and I, I always like to get back. Um, so, as, as has been alluded to, um, I've, I've been doing research on open source software. Uh, for over a decade now with various groups, uh, GitHub, the Linux Foundation, the Omijar Network, uh, and really a lot of the goals are to understand the ways that both businesses and governments uh, can help open support open source and how they can also benefit from it. And I think we've heard some, some various uh, examples of this already today. Um, and I'll say as a researcher, one of the biggest issues in, in doing this has been a lack of, of up-to-date and detailed data, in particular on, on government policies uh, across the world, right? Uh, so CSIS uh, had done some, some great work on this in, in aggregating these policies uh, uh, a while ago, <laughs> over a decade ago. Uh, and so I personally am very excited to see uh, and uh, to look at the, the, the data that of this new data set that Jenny was just talking about. Um, and I, I think it really makes this, this giant leap forward in supporting resource, uh, research related to open source um, <clears throat> by cataloging all these kind of diverse and very different policies that governments have. Uh, so I'll just quickly mention just one or two research projects that our team has been working on to kind of give you a taste of, of what this, this uh, uh, data sets and, and related data can allow the research community to do uh, in both a broader context, so it's you know not just U.S. focused, and also in a very detailed manner, it allows us to kind of go very deep on these topics. Uh, so for example, 
I had dug into uh, deep into the results of uh, a French open source regulation that's that's in the database uh, now, the new one, um, related to um, France basically required uh, in their procurement uh, contracts for you know when the government was uh, uh, re releasing RFPs for third parties to submit um, for new technology projects, it weighted open source uh, pieces of the project more heavily. So companies that bid with open source as part of their bid uh, were more likely to win. Um, and so that kind of simple, you know, it, part of it, mostly it was focused on cost savings. Um, there were some other reasons they did it as well, but that kind of simple procurement related policy actually led to a large number of uh, uh, increase in open source activity in France compared to the, the rest of Europe. Uh, so there were more contributions coming from France, more new projects, more fixes, more updates. Uh, and then also it was perhaps even more interesting is that we see this kind of spillover effect to where uh, France actually increases the levels of, of IT labor. So the number of people in the IT workforce increases as a result of this engagement with open source. There's an increase in uh, IT related startups in France as well. So both you know large companies are hiring more IT folks as a result, and there's more startups as a result uh, uh, of these types of policies. And then one thing Shelly mentioned, uh, uh, patents related to software, actually as a result of this, this policy, we see a decrease in software patents, um, which we, we think we're, we're, our team's digging a little further into this, but we think it's a result of kind of more programmers and more people being exposed to open source as an option and being less worried about uh, patenting their software, which others in the economics world have argued is actually a very beneficial thing because software moves so fast, but patents are so long uh, that it actually dampens innovation in this particular, you know, in the software space. Um, and then at a broader level, um, you know, we, we, we look looked into um, kind of globally the relationship between the open source and entrepreneurship, as, as Shelley alluded to, uh, and found that increases in open source activity across the globe uh, lead to increases in entrepreneurial activity in most countries. Um, I will say, though, one of the, the more interesting things we found here is that this relationship was much greater for countries that already had some fairly high levels of, of human capital and human resources and, and things you know, that we might think are, are actually uh, um, you know, uh, uh, col collaborate and add value to um, the, the open source activity, right? And so this is interesting because we may not be able to see all countries getting the same benefits from investments in open source uh, that some, you know, that some do, right? And this, uh, this is related to, but not, you know, totally a result of kind of GDP and things like that. But in particular, is kind of investments in human capital, in education and things like that actually go very much hand in hand with being able to get benefits out of open source. Um, and so on that last point, uh, Laura touched a lot upon this a little bit, but one of the things I'm, I'm you know, that we're, we're thinking about today um, is a, an interesting kind of fact that myself and others in, in this world have noticed recently. And that's that there's actually, um, there's been this large uptick in interest in open source uh, being used to help developing countries, which is, which is fantastic. Uh, but most of this interest is looking for kind of off the shelf solutions for that for various government functions, right? So what does government do? You know, think about tax collection, driver's licenses, education, all these types of things. Be, uh, countries are looking for kind of off the off the shelf solutions. But open source is is less in that vein of op off the shelf than it used to be. And instead, open source, a lot of it now is focused on uh, creating the building blocks that underlie kind of these end, end user applications rather than just the, the full applications themselves. So one of the things that I think, you know, especially in kind of the global global context that we have to think about is this kind of mismatch between what's needed for, for helping developing economies um, and what's actually being produced by the, the open source community. So I think that's something we can keep an eye on uh, in the future. Um, so uh, with that, um, thanks so much again for having me and uh, I'm looking forward to the discussion. Great, thank you. Yeah, I, the, I would have called it modular, modular development, which is a big change in software. And so it's a little bit of a shock at some of the projects that I think Alan worked on looking into the provenance. I love using provenance for software as opposed to an antique. Um, looking at the provenance of the software shows the importance of this modular approach. But uh, here's what we're going to do. Uh, you should have a question button if you're watching online. If you want to have, ask a question, hold up your hand and we'll get a card to you to fill it out. Um, I think what I'll do is ask now if there are any reactions from the panel members to the remarks we've heard. And then maybe I'll kick things off with a question or two. But uh, any reactions, Alan? Uh, you've sat patiently. Uh. 
Um, so, I, but one thing I will underscore, uh, I, I think, to all four panelists is that we desperately need to understand, I'm going to use quotes around the problem. Uh, so Frank's work on the census, this work on collecting policies uh, and, and having some insight into where's the emphasis been, what's been working, uh, tracking the different projects, and of course, having a, a huge source of, of data about developers is, is really going to help us move forward. And so that's the, the comment I'm going to say is, um, while this research that's come out is, is a fantastic start, um, if there are folks out there, grad students um, or, or organizations, uh, we, we need to understand the problem. We need to understand the shape of the curve between the massive infrastructure projects and the smaller projects. Um, one thing that we're interested in here at CISA is uh, what are the pieces that are particularly relevant to critical infrastructure? Um, a lot of the great work that's happened is focused on uh, data for modern applications. That's where the data is. Um, and so we're looking uh, and trying to plan some research projects with our colleagues at DHS S&T uh, to sort of say, well, what's unique uh, picking a, an example at random of critical sure what are the open source components that are particularly relevant to water compared to the modern thing? And so that's an area where maybe there aren't massive resources available today. That's something where the government can step in. So understanding what are the massive public goods where government is needed to both write checks and help coordinate is going to be a key part moving forward and advancing the agenda to support open source and support sustainability. Thank you. Uh, anyone else? Uh, Shelley, I think you were first. Did you have any reactions to what's been said? I think we right into, from my perspective, we move right into question and answers. And I think it's, um, you know, I think, it, I guess maybe just I'd say, like, to, to what problem, I guess, when we're trying to figure out what, what are the solutions. Like, there's, there definitely are um, a number of different issues that I think we all need to solve. And, um, you know, if this was easy, I think then any one of us could go off and do it. And that's one of the beauties of open source and the opportunity for collaboration to sort of tackle these complex uh, and multidimensional problems. So. Great, thanks. Let me just, oh, thank you. Ooh. Goodness, this one's, uh, let me start with this. I have a couple questions, but I'll start with this one because it's fun. Um, how do you address the potential and risks of chat GPT? and now open AI projects for open source. Anyone want to touch that one? So that is something that I've talked to people about, is that you now have uh, uh, something, chat GTP, that can uh, uh, write uh, tweets, paragraphs, perhaps code, uh, in a way that's uh, at a basic level, indistinguishable from human effort. So it'll, it'll be a very different world. I, well, I'll stop there, but Alan, you looked like you were gonna say something. And, and before we sort of get into, oh my God, AI is coming to eat us. Uh, <laughs> right, there, there are a lot of things that I've heard people discuss, which is very useful. So uh, perhaps the first and foremost is documentation uh, is one of the hardest, least popular part of development in general, and especially in you know open source volunteer run uh, projects. So that's an area where we can sort of imagine, gosh, it'd be great if we can sort of advance and, and nudge in that direction. Um, but I, I think the other piece is, I, I don't think the risks of these kinds of automated tools are, are genuinely unique compared to malicious or sloppy actors. Uh, right, a lot of the things that we still care about from a security perspective. Where did this code come from? Is it obfuscated? Uh, does the maintaining organization, defined broadly, have good internal processes? Um, right, the, the, the threats aren't truly unique from an AI perspective, I don't think, um, other than scale. And the nice thing is, scaling types of attacks are actually kind of hard to hide if you know what you're looking for. And so that's an area where both organizations that depend on open source 
should be and are a little bit starting to invest in detecting that kind of determined adversary. Um, and of course, getting up to the national security level, since we're at CSIS, this is something that is increasing on the radar for those who are sort of tracking that kind of adversary. I'll just follow up on that and just to say to talk about, you know, maybe before we get into the deep, dark problems, um, you know, to talk about the opportunity a little bit. And you said, you know, you, you talked about um, documentation. And when we look at things like, um, you know, a tool that's been put out by, by GitHub um, with OpenAI, um, you know, developers are loving it generally and coding a lot faster. And some of the tedious tasks that they were originally going and looking and breaking the flow, they're able to do now incorporate into their work streams. Um, so there are tremendous opportunities uh, in this kind of technology. And I think it's also then, therefore, it's critically important uh, that we address the challenges in a proactive, thoughtful um, way as we all embark down this path. Well, we have another question, and I'm going to build on it with a follow on. Oh, oh, I'm sorry, Frank, I didn't see you. Go That's ahead. okay. That's okay. The, the uh, perils of being <laughs> virtual. Um, I just wanted to, to echo these sentiments. I think, you know, like any technology, there's there's great opportunity and and there can be risk, right? And I was going to mention Copilot, which which uh, 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 was just mentioned, uh, as well with GitHub, with, that is is going to make coders better, faster, more efficient, et cetera, et cetera. But it does open some doors that for for increased risks. And I think it's a question of you know us as a society to to identify the risks and and make sure we mitigate those as best as possible, while not you know preventing the technology from, from helping us, right? And I think that's where we are. We're still in the Wild West in the early days of it, um, but we can't, we've done this before with other technologies and we figured it out. And so I, you know, I'm optimistic that we'll do the same. That's a, that's a good lead into one of the following questions, which is, um, and maybe we can go back and start with Frank again, is as the business case for the use of open source software change, I mean, what is the, what would you describe the business case now as? Sure, I'm, I'm happy to start with that. Um, I mean, I, th I think open source, you know, it's, it's evolved just like the policies that the governments have taken towards it evolved, business policies have evolved towards it as well. So in, in the old days, it was, you know, kind of seen as, oh, this is something maybe people can do on their, their, their spare time or, or things like that. Whereas today, it's, you know, we, many companies have employees that they're paying almost full time and 90 plus percent of their time is paid to work on open source, right? And so it's really become a, a key part of many business operations, right? And so I think one of the things that we're, you know, our, my, my and others research agendas are looking at now is kind of when and, and in what context does it make sense for, for companies to, to collaborate um, and, and work on open source software together, even with their competitors? And in what context should they be competing against their their competitors right and so i think this is changing how we think about business strategy because in the old days it was you know you had your own set of resources and skills and all these things that were inside the company and you did what you could with those to compete against your competitor but today uh, lots of those resources are open source software uh, and are shared with your competitors right shared with the world but also shared with your competitors and so increasingly we're seeing more and more companies you know, very open to using open source, but still trying to figure out when it makes sense for them to contribute and help. And certainly some of the efforts of, of the Linux Foundation and GitHub and the Open Source Security Foundation uh, around security of open source is an area that everybody can agree we're all better off if you know this software is more secure, right? And so at least there, um, we've seen less kind of friction on, on companies being willing to contribute to open source uh, and help make it more secure, which is which is great. That's a great place to start. In the earlier debates, the issue was uh, over procurement, and you had in, in the dawn of the open source policy debate, two of the tech giants sort of butting heads over procurement mandates or not procurement mandates. And things have changed remarkably since then. I date it back probably to 2003, 2004. But maybe we can start with uh, some of the panelists here. What should the focus of policy be now? One is clearly security. Another one is opportunity and innovation. If you were prioritizing the policies that government should be thinking about, where would you go? So 
Uh, I don't know who wants to start. Maybe uh, Laura, do you want to start? Sure. I, I kind of ended my comments on this point, and I'll reinforce it and build a little bit off what Frank said. But um, I think hearing from the report, there's a lot of focus on you know sovereignty, on security, on what open source, the benefits it provides to governments and companies. Um, I would love to see more focus and understanding of how we support the community of open source developers in tandem to those incentives so that we're not just talking about the security of the technology itself um, or kind of the, the Western economic growth that it can create, but also how do we support a global community of open source where we're really talking more about sustainability and when it's great to see companies collaborating more with each other and to see them more open to adopting open source code, but where and how can we incentivize more collaboration with civil society on this? How can we make sure that companies are contributing back when they are using this code, when finding ways to support it? So I would love to see us kind of take one step further, which is to say, let's not just incentivize the use and the security, but let's also provide support and sustainability mechanisms for the community for whom a lot of this code is coming from. Anyone else? Go ahead. No? Okay, well, we have more questions coming from the audience if no one wants to talk. Oh, go ahead. Add, I'm sorry. I was, I was just going to add. Yeah, I, I think of that as like not just be a consumer. You need to be a producer, and um, you know that I think that's just fundamentally different when you think about how you know it, governments that are more advanced in these areas are thinking about how they're contributing versus just how they're consuming uh, open source. Because in order to participate and get value, that's like that's critical. I mean, that un underlies the entire uh, premise of open source. So. And let, let me just hard. add on to that as well. I, I didn't mean I to. <laughs> sorry, I didn't mean to imply that that that's all companies should do. Absolutely, we need to be pushing them to contribute to more than just security. And the same thing with governments. And I think there's been some um, some good policy recommendations coming out of the the EU and a group called Open Forum Europe that did a study for the European Commission that talks about how can we encourage both individuals and companies um, to be contributing more to more than just security. And, and, and I think there's a lot in, that can be done in that direction that we're just starting to, to make those moves. That's something. Um, so besides more policy recommendations, I think something that I, I really came out from this project with is I, we also need to see more implementation over time of the existing policy and the policy recommendations that are out there. Um, you know, it's been very hard to, to actually see what is the impact of these, you know, greatly thought and discussed recommendations when, when you don't really know what happened afterwards or, you know, was it sustained over time or was it a one-off? So, you know, I, I think really thinking about the, the sustainability, not only of open source software, but also of the policies that we're making and what is the time frame in which we want to see um, an effect is going to be, it's something that I would like to see uh, moving forward. Great. Yeah, I think if we have time, we'll come back to some of the issues you ran in with collection, it ran into with collection and categorization, because it was harder to do it this time than the last time, which I guess is good. This is a question from someone uh, self-identified as an open source developer. Uh, what types of solutions could help centralize and standardize open source development? Is this an area the government would like to help in? Kind of, go ahead, Alan. <laughs> Speaking as the government. <laughs> The, the, the full caveat is, right, the short version is uh, this is something that we need to be very careful around um, and probably want to have as much of these solutions come from the community. And even that, right, is, is quite fraught, um, right? There, there are a number of different organizations out there where the U.S. government simply wouldn't be welcome, and that's okay. Uh, and so essentially the, the model that I would sort of advocate is saying, well, let's look at what tools have been popular and have been embraced uh, 
and and then see what we can do to promote that while still acknowledging that if one set embraces them, right, large corporate open source users uh, say, well, we want this, well, we shouldn't necessarily hold that out as something that's going to scale and work for everything. So I think the humility is not something that the US government is known for, but I think that's something that we absolutely have to bring with us as we engage and promote. And then the second piece is sort of the experimentation uh, and getting that data feedback loop of, we've tried this, has it had an impact, has it had scale, and then the last piece is what are our levers for pushing this um, through projects like the Open Source Security Foundation and other uh, technical and regional hubs uh, that are trying to coordinate um, as well as sector specific. So I think, you know, for getting to that point. So uh, I, I wish I had some great things to point to. Uh, there are some plans uh, to, as um, OpenSF says, turn money into security. Uh, but even that needs, and funding education for developers, but even that needs to have a tighter feedback loop to say, is this working? Anyone else on this topic? If not, it does sort of flow in. Or are we holding up your hand? No? OK. It does flow into the next question here, which is, I hope we didn't get too much of a security focus here, because I think the, the, the issue, I had, was at a conference once in China and talking to a Chinese software company where, you know, I said, don't you ever think about the risks of some of what you're doing? And the it, CEO said, let's not talk about risk, let's talk about opportunity. And so that's a good mantra for me, uh, and probably for them too, but it builds into this one. Is it helpful to move from, a secu from the sec security as a conversation and get agencies like Commerce to play a larger role, imagining this as a complement to CIS's effort? I think what that, uh, I, I like that question, but I think it's, do we need to focus more on the economic opportunity, the business opportunity? I, I want to tell a very brief uh, story of, of where exactly, where, where I think that's happening from the open source community. Um, and from a national security perspective, there was concern about uh, a widely used operating system for uh, automate, for, for drones, essentially, uh, having some influence from a country that we weren't wild about. And so high level government policy saying, hey, red flag on this thing that's used everywhere. And so the open source world said, well, we'll just write our own. And so now it's, it's a very popular Linux Foundation project. They, they meet regularly, they're building it out. They're expanding it into new features and new domains that weren't part of it. And so I think that's this area where essentially open source is a response to government policy as well as, as something that right, we need to worry about on the security side of things. Shelley, how much do you pay attention to government policy in your job? I mean, what are the things you look for? I mean, it's, it's definitely part of, it's definitely a big part of my job. Um, so you know, we're very focused on developer first, so helping represent what's good for developers as, you know, in a community that has a big voice because there are so many um, people in the community and us thinking as the home, our, our vision and our mission is to be the home for all developers. Um, so we are very focused on, on looking at policies and thinking about how um, they uniquely uh, represent open source because there are so many unique things that are very different than other kinds, as we talked about, commercial software. Um, so when you think about you know, the security discussion or you think about really any other discussion, how does that impact open source developers uniquely and often asymmetrically given what the community is like and how do we think about how we allocate the roles and responsibilities and so GitHub's role in that is to advocate on behalf of developers. 
I just want to weigh in on that as well. I think I think security ends up being low hanging fruit is probably the wrong term, but the easiest thing for everybody to agree is important and needs some some government policy related to it. Uh, but I, I wrote a piece about six months ago talking about what the the set of things that that kind of the U.S. government can do related to open source, and only maybe a third of that was related to security. So I think there's to the question you know that was asked. I think there's things that commerce can do, NSF, lots of other folks, um, uh, small business administration even there's lots of things that we can do to kind of enhance this growth in the community and the contributions um, beyond just security uh, that can happen at, at all levels but certainly at governmental policy as well when you think about the opportunity side things like sustainability uh, people collaborating on that things like accessibility um, both in how we proactively collaborate to solve accessibility challenges and how we ensure that developers that are using the GitHub platform have access to tools and resources to you know, build in things more by design uh, than plugging holes later. Uh, Laura, maybe we can anoint you the representative of civil society here. <laughs> So what's the civil society perspective on this? So we've talked about business opportunity, economic opportunity. We've talked about security. Where does it fit in with development and where does it fit in with protecting civil society? From kind of a US government regulatory policy development approach? Yeah, if we were gonna do something useful for a change, what would it look like? <laughs> um, I'll start with the low hanging fruit and then maybe the big vision. I think one of the things that GitHub does an amazing job of right now is representing the open source community and the needs of developers in these kind of policy discussions. I would love to see more panels like this or more discussions where civil society are represented and bringing a voice to the policies that are being developed. Um, again, I think if we want uh, and open, if we want to kind of maintain the amazing parts of open source, the innovation, the diversity, all of those types of things, I think having a seat at the table to discuss the full impact of the policies, I think is really interesting and important. And also to be able to then share back learnings and best practices into that community. Um, so I would love to see more interaction there. I think it would lead to more comprehensive and kind of effective policy from a civil society perspective. Um, and then again, and I, I've said it a couple of times now, but I think resourcing and support for the maintenance and sustainability of open source tools just in a line with policy development. Um, I think, as Shelley said it great, there's just necessarily an asymmetrical impact on open source developers when policies are put in place. And a lot of times when we talk about security or regulation or accountability, we're kind of pushing down though that extra work, we're pushing down that accountability to the developers. So as we are doing that, how do we also empower that community and resource that community and think about really effective sustainability models? We're actually past the witching hour. Uh, Georgia, do you have any more questions? One more, and that will be it. I will say that it's a lot more fun to write the code than to maintain it. I think we all know that. <laughs> okay, thank you. Oh. Hey, I can't read your writing. <laughs> Can you read it? Just read it. For Henya, and if you did looked at the OMB federal source code policy and what you found. Did you look at the OMB federal source code policy and what did you find? Um, you're asking a specific policy out of the 669. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, that's the question. You can decline. Um, I say my lawyer's advice me I'm, to take the fifth. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure it's in the data set and uh, it's going to be yeah, categorize the same as the others. <laughs> okay, any final remarks from anyone since we are at the end? No, no? Chance of a lifetime? Frank? Uh, thank you for hosting this important discussion. Uh, we're glad to participate. Agreed. It's a great topic, and I think one of the things I'm trying to, one of the research themes for this year for us is sovereignty, uh, because I think it will play a bigger role. Open source clearly fits in. Another tentative research theme is the shift towards coding as an essential skill. 
So I started, you know, people used to say we need to teach STEM education in, in grade schools. I think, you know, my coding is, being able to code is gonna be important too. We can have a debate over that, what you actually need to know, but in, in both of those areas, um, I think open source, uh, which started out as kind of a cult almost, and has now become a, a global, global phenomenon, a global community. Uh, we're really grateful that we were able to, to have this event. Uh, thank you to GitHub. Thank you to, to all the people who provided us with information. It really helped. Uh, thank you to Eugenia for spearheading this effort. And thanks to everyone for coming this morning. Thank you.